Yeehaw! So, as you can see, maybe. Maybe you can see. Somebody can see. <laughs> um, I'm getting a little braver with my... Um, abstract oil sticks right before I start a oil I can control very fairly well how much I want those lines to show up let me see I want it I want to, some, some real red in there somewhere a little bit more that's crazy <laughs> all right hello my name is Dan thank you for joining me today this is daily art adventure number 702 <laughs> transitioning 701 was yesterday evening at which time I spilled a whole bunch of blue paint onto the floor of my studio enough of that um, and now I'm all of this is acrylics except for the oil stick I just did and I'm switching to oil once again and my go-to medium that I like very much is liquid all All right, now I'm back. I think, am I back? Come on, come on, come on. There we go, all right. So I like liquid a lot, partly because it plays well with water. And I know, I know from experience that the liquid adheres very well to the um, acrylic underpainting. So that's part of the reason why I like the uh, liquid. The thing I don't like about liquid is it is kind of smelly. For that reason, I have a window unit air conditioning two feet to my left, moving a fair amount of air that direction. So I feel like my atmospheric hygiene is pretty safe. All right. You know, find yourself looking forward to each new layer each new each new phase of the painting process and so that describes that describes me pretty well because i in fact really do look forward to each new phase each new layer of the painting process now that right there was permanent rows and to tell you the truth I'm not completely happy with the color of that permanent rose hmm I have I have um, Indian yellow hello uncle 60 <laughs> that is because I own them <laughs> figure that out <laughs> okay there's two brands here R and F and Shiva between the two, I like the R and F better because they're softer. But the Shiva are working pretty, plenty fine. This is what the cover looks like. Artist paint stick Shiva. Oh, and it's a Richardson. Richardson. Okay, Hello, Sheer in London. Good to have you on board. Like <laughs> you just read an article on painter's dementia. <laughs> uh oh, uh oh. Are you trying to tell me that? Are are they saying that us? playing our whole lives with these bad fumes. I, I hope not. <laughs> Are you just kidding? Are you serious? <laughs> so maybe we should all go back to turpentine, eh? <laughs> No, my guess is that the studies they did were of old artists who actually used turpentine. I don't know. Right now, I've got um, 
And now I will be, I'm sure, I'll be doing other colors on top of that. Probably some purple violet. Yeah, let's just vignette the corners, darken the corners a little bit. With some purple and some oxide red. I usually rely on my glaze layer quite a bit actually to bring cohesion to my composition. I really do, it's just such an easy way to lighten and darken areas of the painting. So I just I darkened everything, of course, at the moment, but I will I'll get a little more particular. Like, I'm gonna also darken this corner. Hey, and um, it has sky going all the way across, no buildings. Normally, one of my tall buildings will punch through the top of the painting. But that's not the case here because the buyer of this painting sent me a photograph and the photograph, well, can you see the picture? Not quite here. Let me turn you just for a second, show you the reference. Here's the photograph taped up next to me. This is what my, my client probably is hoping that I'll do a painting with a lot of sky. Okay. All you landscape painters, listen up. <laughs> um, One of the most helpful little tips, I guess I'll say it that way, I ever got a simple trick to make your painting compositions more effective. I learned from Bob Rankin. You can Google him, Bob Rankin. Well-known, much-beloved Raleigh artist. And it's a... Uh, a principle I learned from him. Now he learned it from somebody else, but I can't remember where he learned it from. So I'm just going to refer to Bob Rankin. He calls it boundary ratios. And what he means, the boundary of your painting, assuming most of the time we're painting on rectangles or squares. So it doesn't mean you can't do a round. To, so this does not apply to round painting. I imagine most of you, like, like most of me, are painting uh, on rectangles, most of the time, squares occasionally, right? All right, so this refers to paintings on rectangles or squares. And the principle is very simple. Three. Ideally, should be different. Now, but let's just start, let's, right now, I, I just have basically one color from here to here. Now you could say, well, it's dark up here and light down here, okay, but it's a graduation, so hard to say whether that's one or two. Let's call it two. One, two. So dark, light, dark. So there's a three over here. One, two, three. You with me? Over here on this side, uh oh, same thing. Dark, light, dark. One, two, three. So right off the bat, that is not probably or possibly not a good composition because it's even Steven. Got it? So I, I, need to, I need to mess something up somewhere so I get a different number other than three, either here or here. Now here's the real, here's where it really, really comes to play with you landscape painters. If you have a blue sky and your sky goes all the way across the top of the painting, that's a boundary ratio. Get attention. But if you're, <laughs> if you're a if you're a landscape painter, I am saving your butt. <laughs> I hope my mom's not listening because we're not supposed to say butt in my house. I'm trying, this is, this is huge. And I cannot tell you how many, I cannot tell you how many landscapes I see where the artist does not know this print. Yeah, that means, so, and I, no buildings, no trees. That means I have to punch clouds or something. Here's a typical amateur mistake. 
blue sky with clouds. <laughs> or clouds. But all blue along the top. No, no, no. One of those clouds, at least, one of those has to punch through the top of the painting. Then you've got a boundary ratio of at least three. You know, blue sky, white cloud, blue sky. To be overly simple about it. All right, are you with me? That is huge. And some of you, as I said, I, I hope you're paying attention. Because if you're paying attention, your landscape paintings, I just saved you, ruining. And speaking of which, at the moment, I have a boundary number of one at the bottom of my painting. It's all the same color, same dark. Bad, bad, bad. So right now, <laughs> when it comes to boundary ratios on this painting, I'm screwed. <laughs> um, this is not a good painting. I'm not worried about it because I know the trick. And so I'm going to make sure, let me, let me say that more correctly, I am going to make sure, <laughs> that's for all you English majors, See, right there. So now I've got a boundary ratio of at least three. One, two, three, maybe four or five. One, two, three, four, five. Easy fix. Got it? All right. So I'm done with wiping for a little while. Let me find some smaller brushes. I want to do some a little bit more careful glazes now. Um, I'm going to start with Indian yellow. Oh, I love Indian yellow. So should you. It's the only truly uh, transparent yellow. I mean, there might be, you know, in common usage, I'll say. I, somebody's going to come back and say, no, don't forget, forget Aurelian yellow. <laughs> I think I'm saying that right. There re really is a color, somebody somewhere called Aeolian, Aurelian, Elorian, <laughs> Adori wait, Dorian. That's a big storm heading our way right now. All right. Anyway, <laughs> ADD. Um, <laughs> don't bother me. I'm enjoying my life of ADD. If that's what it is, I'm having a good time. So leave me alone. <laughs> Isn't that pretty? Um, Indian yellow, if you're not used to it, when you... When you and you squeeze them up on your palette, your first reaction will be, huh, well, that's not nearly, that's kind of brownish looking. You know, it doesn't look, it doesn't look like a real uh, intense yellow. But in this case, looks are deceiving because as soon as you either mix it with white or apply it transparent, the way I just did, as soon as you do that, man, it goes, it goes electric on you, which in, as long as you know that, which I do, I, I love it. I love that color. Now I'm doing uh, permanent rows. We're just do, taking a tour of all my favorite colors right here. <laughs> permanent rows, Indian yellow, and phthalo blue. as far as color, color goes. Probably the, the, the color of paint that I use them up. Do you understand the difference between color and color of paint? You know what I mean? The color of the tube of paint that I use, the two colors I use more than anything else besides white. White doesn't count. White is what I use the most. But besides that is uh, oxide red and um, ultramarine blue. So those are the technically the colors I use the most. But, or is that sort of my, my favorite colors to put on the canvas it would be Indian yellow, permanent rose, and and thalo blue. And they're all transparent by the way. That's significant. That's part of the reason why they, they are all on that favorites list because they're all very transparent. Of course, so is dioxazine violet. That's also a favorite. If any of you, and, and every once in a while, it happened again this morning, one of my viewers, one of my viewers who does not leave comments, by the way, 
Some people like to come and hide out and never say anything, and that's all right. Um, but uh, people tell me I'm, you know, I'm painting along with you. I'm trying to learn your technique and so on. That's great, great, great fun. Glad you're doing it. You know, and, and that's, yeah, do it as long as it's beneficial. And then at some point in your journey, you'll, you'll peel off from following me, of course. Very appropriate. And then you'll follow somebody else or, you know, as you become more and more and more with each person you, that you follow, so to speak, you become more and more uniquely you. That certainly is what has happened to me. Anyway, those of you who are trying to, who are being influenced by me, the, if you had to use, I think, one word to describe my painting technique, it would be transparent. On, and this painting here is a perfect example. I haven't done any opaque color yet. I've done in acrylics, as you, I did opaque white. I'm not calling that a color, you understand? I did white. But all my colors, and this is very typical of, of my process, all my colors so far have been transparent. So if you had to use one word to describe Dan Nelson's technique, transparent would be a very good, very good word. All right, and um, the artist who influenced me the most, there have been several, but the artist who influenced me the most in this regard, um, I think he died when I was about two years old, is Maxfield Parrish. Google him. It's pretty much everyone in the Western world, you'll say, who? And, and then when you look at his stuff, you'll say, oh, him, because you've seen his stuff. You, or you've seen knockoffs, you've seen imitations of his stuff. For instance, a funny, funny, going back 30 years now, but the, the cover of the Princess Bride movie, the Princess Bride movie cover or poster or whatever, is a knockoff of a Maxfield Parrish painting. Anyway, Maxfield Parrish. So in the world of transparent, world the rules are different in transparent-ville than they are in opaque-ville. Okay, I'm being silly. Opaque-ville is traditional oil painting where, where the artist mixes colors on his palette. In fact, the way I did the last two days with my little boy's portrait, I was painting in a traditional manner. It was all opaque colors mixed on my palette. All right, so in that world, you mix the color you want and then put it on your canvas. In my world, you do almost all your mixing right on the canvas and it's layers and layers and layers of transparent. And all that is to say, the rules are different. Let me give you a couple quick, real quick rules. Number one, there's no such thing as transparent red. Take a beautiful naphthol crimson, scarlet lake, cad red, light, medium, or dark, and make them transparent with liquid and in my opinion you put it on the canvas you'll go yuck because it doesn't it does not create a pleasant effect you need a magenta or my favorite is so you can use magenta you can use carmine quinacridone magenta uh, uh, permanent rose my favorite um, so there's no in the transparent world there's no transparent red it's transparent magenta or permanent rose number two Yellows are not transparent. Cad yellow, lemon yellow, half, and so on. Um, I should write these down. These are the, the rule changers going from opaque mixing to transparent mixing. Um, um, the, so the only transparent yellow is that I know of. So when it goes transparent, it also goes cool. Okay, so yellow made transparent, the, the temperature, here's warm and here's cool, it moves away from orange and towards chartreuse green, okay? Uh, thirdly, blue, transparent, ultra, uh, ult, ultramarine, so-so, transparent, phthalo blue, good. Um, in the world of transparent, purple is the darkest color. And that's all. That's all. That's the rules. I'm going to stop right there. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Did you catch all that?
you can go back you and listen to, you rewind and listen to that again so the rules change so to speak that the 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 way you paint changes in a number of respects when you switch from traditional opaque mixing mixing color painting to transparent all right i'm i'm ragging once again lifting out one more time here and i'm fairly happy um let me look no i, I mean i am happy don't get me wrong <laughs> but <laughs> i'm going to um i'm going to do a little bit more i want um a little bit more warmth down here so i've got indian yellow and orange by the way and again this is only for you newcomers um i do not have any cads or cobalt on my on my palette i just don't use cadmiums or cobalts because i don't need them i'm perfectly content with the colors i have so i say why take the risk why take the chance uh, with those heavy metal uh, colors if, if I don't need to so uh, so my my I, oh, the reason I said that is because of orange orange is the hardest color to find if you if you're avoiding cats oh and by the way um, generally speaking um, cad yellow imitation is perfectly fine cad red no cad orange no cad orange imitation cad red imitation is what i'm saying let me say that again more clearly okay it's i don't think anybody can tell the difference and if you can i'd love to hear from you i don't think anybody can tell the difference between imitation cad yellow and real cad yellow in other words they've managed they manufacturers have managed to imitate yellow very well but uh arrogance warning <laughs> brace yourself <laughs> I'm going to sound arrogant just for a second, but it's true. I, pr I swear, I do solemnly swear. It is true. Um, I can spot uh, cad yellow imitation. No, no, cad red, not yellow, cad red. I can spot cad red imitation across the room. Now, when it's transparent, because I've done it more, on more than one occasion, um, I'd be painting and I'll look at a student's work and say, um, did you just use a glaze of CAD red imitation? Uh-huh. I said, I thought so. Okay, so avoid CAD red imitation. But CAD yellow is okay. I, uh, you may, am I making sense? And CAD yellow? Okay. Now, what reds do I use? Easy peasy. I have three reds, typically. Scarlet Lake is my warm, close to orange, warm red. Naphthol Crimson, it's a dark blood red, cool, mid, middle cool red. And then Permanent Rose is my cool, cool, cool red, my magenta. Okay, it's got a lot of blue in it. So those are my, those are my go-to reds. The hard part is orange. And frankly, I just buy, and you don't need orange you, if you have, if you have Scarlet Lake, but this is, oh, this is Williamsburg. And it's called Orange Permanent. And yeah, as I thought, it's got one, two, it's got two pigments in it. Okay. Do you understand the significance of that? Let's look at, let's look at this, uh, ooh, <laughs> this Lucas. Okay, this is a cheap Indian yellow, and it's got two pigments in it. And whenever you see two pigment pigment numbers, it's fine print on the back. P Y pigment, Y for yellow. P Y eighty three, P O pigment orange thirty six. So it's real simple. It's not like real high tech or anything. That just just means what it sounds like. P Y. I know you can't read this, but I'm showing you where it is. It's on the back of every tube somewhere. It's supposed to be. And generally speaking, so that tells me that this is not an ideal Indian yellow, and it tells me this is not an ideal orange. Um, but that's what I've got up here. As as you know, if you follow me, I have I have uh, paint kits. All of, I have another kit downstairs and, and two more in the car. One in the garage. One in the trailer. You know what I mean? I have paints everywhere, and so I don't even always know what brand I'm using. 
which will drive you snobs crazy. That's all right, go crazy. Pretty much every paint we use is better than anything Rembrandt ever dreamt of using. Every brush we have is better than anything Rembrandt had. So, <laughs> if I'm not a good painter, it's not because I don't have good paint. <laughs> Rembrandt had way worse than me, so I have no excuse. <laughs> Think about it. <laughs> uh, all right. I am done glazing. Hallelujah. That took long enough, didn't it? That was a little bit longer than normal. Uh, yes, I'll show you the picture I'm drawing again. Hang on. Did it once. Need to do it again. Here it is. There's the photograph that I printed off and laminated it with my handy dandy laminator, which I enjoy very much. All right. So what do I do after the glaze? I'll tell you what has been my tradition for several years after the glaze dark paint or I draw with pencils and again very unconventional and just because there's a, just in case there's anybody new here made by Jerry's Autorama it's called jumbo jumbo whoops jumbo jet black okay and uh, since I might use those let me grab my pencil sharpener here real quick and sharpen both of these very highly technical operation that's a little bit of sarcasm there. A little bit of sarcasm, okay. A lot of sarcasm, not okay. <laughs> a rule for life. <laughs> little happy, good-natured sarcasm, okay. Do you know what sarcasm means, by the way? This, this should put you, put you in some sobriety. You know what sarcasm means? The Greek, flesh tearing flesh eating draw either with pencils or with brushes and one of the determining factors there is I did at least one layer of pencil in the acrylic phase if I can see a lot of pencil then I won't do that but in fact I can't the only I only have one real obvious pencil mark and that's right there so that's a good candidate but here lately so that's my what I've been do doing most of the last 15 years. But here lately, in the last six, 10 months, I've been evolving somewhat away from that because of my fuzz layer that frankly is growing, started out as a small factor in my painting process. And even in, even in the last eight, nine months, um, the fuzz factor, the fuzz stage, phase of my painting has grown in intensity, grown in importance. And if I do pencil or drawing with brushes and then do the fuzz layer, no, look, 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 hang on. I can do drawing with pencil and brushes and then let it dry for a day and come back and do the fuzz, that's okay. Right, because then everything is dry and I do fuzz on top of dry and I can wipe stuff off. But if I do pencil or drawing right now, am I boring you to tears? Hang on. If, <laughs> if I draw now and then do fuzz, I will fuzz out 90% of the drawing that I just did. So here, I'm thinking out loud by the way, I don't know which way I'm gonna go. So now, many t lately I've been more often doing fuzz right now, which used to be later in the process, do fuzz and then do drawing. Okay, let me think. So this is, at this point, either of those options, I'll, I'll, I have three options, fuzz, pencil, or drawing with paint, three options. All of them are correct, all of them will work, and I, I do different ones at different times, so let me shut up for a minute. <laughs> look at my photograph, look at my painting, look at my photograph, look at my painting. I 
scratch my beard. You can't see me. You ladies who don't have beards, sorry, you can't do this. It really helps a lot. <laughs> hmm. If I do draw, this is going to be a short broadcast because, by the way, I'm going to pack all, not all this, but I'm going to pack up and scram downtown. I'm going to be painting downtown this evening. Yes! Back where I belong on the sidewalks of my city. So that'll be, hopefully, Lord willing, Daily Art Adventure 703 later today, this evening. Um, so if I do draw now, I'll stop there and then glaze, I mean, fuzz tomorrow, not glaze, fuzz. Um, I'm leaning toward fuzz layer right now. And then I'll come back tomorrow. It'll be very soft and messy and much lighter than it is right now. Yep, that's what I'm going to do. All right, put the pencils away. Therefore, let me describe for any newcomers who are here, all you old timers, you already know this, you can do this in your sleep. Um, let me look at some of you chat. Wow, you guys are very vociferous today. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Uh, Fox, old Willie, started without you. Nerve, nerve, nerve. <laughs> did, you, did you hear my Canadian accent? That's uh, out about. <laughs> uh oh. So we have some connectivity problems. Uh oh, that is bad, y'all. I'm sorry. Hello, Khalid J. J H J J J. Khalid, good to have you on board. I don't know if you're still here. Hope you are. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's and a Russian friend, welcome. Good to have you here. <laughs> Watching on a black and white phone. That's pretty bare. Thank you, Uncle Sixty, for asking where that man is from. Hello, Eric. Been a while since we heard from you. You're very welcome to have you. Hello from Russia. Everybody greet our friend from Russia. Good to have you here. Hello, Barbara. Good to have you. And Deborah Van Dusen. Um, <laughs> been a while since we heard from you. Good to have you here. <laughs> I'm amazing personality. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> um, oh, I, uh, Uncle Sixty, you, you said what I was going to say. Um, there are some amazing Russian artists. Of course, there's amazing every every nationality, but Russians and Chinese, man, they 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 uh, intimidate me. Deborah, good. Can you see my palette? Let me expand a little bit here. You mentioned my palette. Yeah, I don't know if that's a lot or little. Um, that's but that's typical. <laughs> Michael, you're exactly right. Like taking your glasses off is a great idea. I do that often. <laughs> Susan, good to, good to hear from you. Maybe we can play together someday. Huh? Would that be fun? Sound delay. I will tell you, I'm streaming through a different machine today because my phone was seriously malfunctioning so i don't know if that's why you're getting cut in or up according to my in-ear monitor it's working so all right let's do let's do a glaze i mean wrong <laughs> add let's <laughs> let's do um fuzz layer all right so for you newcomers welcome good to have you on board um I started the fuzz layer about three years ago. Three characteristics of the fuzz layer. Number one, translucent. Not to be confused with transparent. Transparent is clear like glass. Translucent is like wax paper. It's fo foggy, fuzzy, translucent. Translucent, number two, 
very soft, loose edges, very loose edges. Translucent, that means, of course, that it has white in it. So this, for the first time, I'm going to be using uh, white paint in the oil stage, and I'm going to be applying opaque color to the canvas but it's going to be so thin that it's going to be translucent. It, let me say that again. Opaque paint applied very thinly equals translucent color. All right, so it's so technically the paint I'm applying right now is opaque, it has white in it. But it's being applied so thinly in such a thin manner that the effect is translucent. And I am feeling very strongly about getting some of this pinkish. All right, now let me just stop right there. I'm painting the sky. My brushes, like here's the edge of the sky. Here's a building, it's revealing. My sky color has already gone all the way over to here. That's what I mean by soft edge. This is much easier to do with two hands because if you do it with one hand, your brain, your mind can almost keep up with what your one hand is doing and you have time to get nervous and to think too hard. Is that making sense? But if you do it with two hands, there's no way your mind can keep up so there's less time to think too much and get nervous. So as you can see, I'm just going, I'm just going across right the horizon and I'm not at all painting um, objects or I'm not painting really around buildings very much at all, except you see my hands are just going like this. Does that, does that give you a good idea? That's what I call soft. Let me zoom in here just for a second. Again, here I'm, I've got sky color on my brushes and I just painted here, the sky color spills all the way over like an inch and a half, two inches into the dark area. That's called a soft edge. <laughs> Are you with me? And uh, I've been playing, I, I guess would be the best way to put it, I've been playing with this um, fuzz layer concept for three years and of course when I started three years ago I didn't know if it would be a, become a permanent part of my repertoire, a permanent part of my technique or not. I, I thought it might just be a passing fancy. Well quite the contrary it's not a passing fancy it's in fact grown considerably in importance in my in my painting technique. And I, I, I talk about this a lot. Let me repeat it a little bit again because there's some newcomers here. You old timers, you repeat all you regulars. I don't know why you keep tuning in to hear me say the same things over and over, but <laughs> thank you. I enjoy your company. Um, a big part of the thinking behind this fuzz layer is this principle. It's very easy for a painting to have too many hard edges. Nearly impossible for a painting to have too many hard, to have too many soft edges. Let me say, it. very easy for a painting to have too many hard edges. I mean, in a way, I'm just saying what 99% of us artists say I'm tight, I wish I could get looser. Okay, if that's, if that's you, yay, welcome to the club. You're a regular, you're a normal human artist. Because that is the journey that most of us are on. Because the first half of our journey, we're learning how to paint stuff realistically. The second half of our journey, we're having to learn how to paint things that look like paint. Another way to say it is paint loosely. All right, so um, this this fuzz layer, as you can see, is extremely soft-edged. Ridiculous, absurdly. 
I, I hope, for instance, when you see me painting sky color three or four inches into what is not sky, if you're paying attention, if you're awake, you should be saying, doggone, that's crazy. If you're sitting back and smugly folding your arms and say, no, that's what I would have done, <laughs> then you're a better painter than I am. And what the heck are you doing watching me? <laughs> okay, so that's usually not the way it works. <laughs> <laughs> I do watch people that are worse than me on YouTube, and then I get irritated with them and switch. <laughs> Forgive me for being so blunt. <laughs> but if you guys who keep coming back, I'm, I'm assuming, it's, unless you're just a sadist or masochist of some kind, <laughs> unless, you, unless you just like picking on me, <laughs> you come back because you're learning something. All right, does that make sense? All right. That was a dangerous detour, wasn't it? Look at that sky. Whew! Does that make anybody else happy? That makes me happy. <laughs> Let me give you another principle about this fuzz layer okay one is I already gave it to you to repeat it let me repeat it easy for a painting to have too many hard edges nearly impossible for a painting to have too many soft edges so the fuzz layer is like fuzzy edges on steroids period foundational principle number two why does this why does this fuzz layer work number two because the human eye gets a kick out of seeing little bits of the object that have spilled into the background and little bits of the background that have spilled into the object. And I almost always use the same analogy. A red barn, not this painting, let's imagine a red barn with a blue sky behind it. The human eye gets a kick out of seeing little bits of the redness of the barn that is spilled over into the sky and little bits of the blue sky that is spilled over into the barn. Okay, We like to see transposition. Okay, That's just to make it real simple. We like to see transposed colors. And you could ask me why, and I actually have an answer for that, but I'm tired of giving it, so I'm not going to give that right now. Let's move on. <laughs> um, foundational principle number three. Why does the fuzz layer, why am I finding it at least, why am I finding it so effective? By the way, now I've got basically an orange on my brushes, and now I'm not doing sky. I'm doing the sunny side of these buildings. Okay, so I'm doing, I'm thinking, I'm focused now on sun hitting the left side of these buildings. All right, I'll come back and do more of that. Third principle, and I have not stated this one nearly so often. Let me summarize Dan Nelson's approach to painting. It is a most transparent layers B a few opaque bits saved for the very end C maybe I should have wait wait let's do, hang on avoid that let's start over then uh, a summary statement of Dan Nelson's approach to painting a mostly transparent layers layer 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 like right now we've got probably eight layers now this that's A. C, so I'm skipping one. C, opaque bits. <laughs> Little bits of light opaque highlights save for the end. But B now, the middle one, is translucent layers, right between transparent and opaque. Do you see why I did it in that order? Translucent, which is the magic element. With, tran with translucence, we continue to see what's underneath, but it's affected, of course, by what's on top. That's translucent. And most of the magic happens 
in the translucent layer. Okay, the transparent, second, second most important magic. But as far as uh, the wondrous effects, if you will, are created by playing with translucent color. Okay, now that's something I did not know 15 years ago when I started painting this way. I did not know that at all. I started right, I started doing those three layers. I just didn't understand really the importance of the middle one. I did not understand the importance, the magic, if you will, of that C, that, that uh, um, translucent layer. Now, I am I'm going to come in here in a few minutes with a rag once again. I'm going to paint with a rag, and I am going to, to rub down little bits of this uh, translucent stuff, this translucent fuzz layer, where, wherever I want. But I'm not there yet, so let's, let's continue. Um, yeah, I need to trade brush, switch brushes here. Um, and I'm going to do some blue sky now, translucent fuzz layer blue. Now, let me tell you a little bit about what it's like for me to maybe years. It scared the pants off me. You'll notice this video only goes down so far. <laughs> That's a joke. Sorry. I am wearing pants. <laughs> um, but doing this loose, loose, loose stuff was just like, I didn't have the nerve to do this a couple years ago when I, when I started this fuzz layer because it looks forever like I'm just ruining the painting, doesn't it? Why? Because it's too soft. Some of you might be saying, well, I heard what you said about paintings you know can easily have too many hard but don't you think because I say it's nearly impossible for a painting to have too many soft edges and some of you are saying yeah but you've reached that <laughs> and, and 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 my answer is yeah that's because my painting's not done yet okay so I go overboard on softness because I know when I come in here with some drawing with pencils drawing with hard edge and so on and so forth I've got to, I'm going to be adding a, really quite a bit of hard edges on top of this. And then this will come into balance, if I can use that word. It's like, oh, now it works. Does that make sense? Right now it doesn't work because it's, it's too much of a good thing, if you will. And again, not, not trying not to, I know I've said this several times this morning. Forgive me for being self-focused, idiosyncratic. But but it it I want you to I just want you to be able to put me in a in a grid put me in a in a box so that you can under compare what I do to com what other people do and what you do. Um, another way to describe my approach to painting is layers and layers and layers, right? So distinct phases, distinct steps, and each step. This is the important thing I want to say. Each step focuses on one specific problem or issue. One, each layer is a particular hurdle, or each layer is a rung on the ladder, whichever analogy you like. While I am working on one issue, I don't even bother my mind thinking about other issues. For instance, right now, 
The task at hand is local color. And by the way, the sky is gorgeous. And let me have it. Yeah, the, the real effect is somewhere between that and that you're getting a lot of glare. But the, the, the sky is much closer in color than it was before I started the fuzz, okay? Um, so in the fuzz layer, I'm focused on local color and soft edges. Therefore, I do not bother my mind worrying, for instance, like, golly, I wonder if I'm doing too many soft edges. I don't worry about that. Does that make sense? Likewise, after this, I'll be doing pencils. The job at that time will be to do skinny, dark lines. I don't fret and worry over, golly, I wonder if I'm doing too much pencil. Does that make sense? Um, the one layer where I take all of those things and, and weigh them out carefully is what I call the final edit layer, just like it sounds. It's at that point that I quote unquote worry, <laughs> I don't really worry, but it's at that point that I balance things out. Too much pencil, cover it up. Too much fuzz, put a hard edge. Too much hard edge, put some fuzz, and so on. Uh, so I, 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 the, the final edit layer is very important, as you can probably perceive by that description. But it really frees my mind up here in the, these middle stages, like right now. Like, oh no, what if I'm doing too much soft edges? Doesn't bother me a bit. I'm gonna fix, I'll worry about that later. And I don't really, I don't literally mean worry either, because <laughs> I'm not gonna worry about it. I'm just gonna fix it. Does that make sense? And this, so um, in the in the drawing stages, I don't worry about color or values. In the in the glazing stages, I don't worry about drawing, and so on. So and I I'm just I I've, I've discovered that that's a, a good way to for me to paint. Isolate, isolate, isolate one problem at a time really simplifies the painting pro it is of course please you understand don't you there's a there's as many different ways to paint as there are human beings who paint you know so my, i'm not saying mine is by any means the only way or the best way or anything like that it's just a way it's but it is unusual i, I didn't try to i say this sometimes i didn't i didn't set out to be weird <laughs> it's just turned out that way <laughs> I didn't, oh, I remember 15 years ago. I keep making reference to that, by the way. Let me, a little bit of history, just for fun. I haven't told this story in a long time. I was a professional freelance illustrator for decades, essentially from 1972 until 2004. Okay, I was, a, among other things, I had other career detours, but essentially I was an artist who drew things realistically because that was my job i was an illustrator right and i was one of, i was a realistic illustrator again you can you can see that work at dannelsonart.com and click on illustration page you can see dozens or scores maybe hundreds i don't know of, of samples of my work um and 2004, I found myself at a uh, turning point, career crisis in my career. Um, the world of illustration was dying at a rapid rate, and uh, we, I had a, a very good friend who was one of those connector type people, kind of well-connected, um, fairly wealthy, you know, moved in the circles of people that have influence and money. And um, she said, well, Dan, I think you should be in this gallery. I'll leave it unnamed at the moment. She said, I think I'm a good friend with the owner of this gallery, and I think you should be her friend, the gallery owner, and said, look, this is my friend Dan Nelson. Don't you think he should be in your gallery? <laughs> yeah, does that make sense? And uh, the gallery opener, the <laughs> no, the gallery owner, <laughs> not the gallery opener, the gallery owner, <laughs> who was also the opener, by the way, <laughs> the, 
the gallery owner was a woman and she said well he's got he's got lots of talent but it won't sell tell him to give me something that pops all right I think I'm done with the fuzzly here by the way she said he's got lots of talent but it won't sell tell him to do something for me that pops well as you can imagine I was a self-respecting egotistical artist <laughs> I knew I was good <laughs> and so that kind of irritated me that this woman said it won't sell give me something that pops I haven't told this story in a long time so maybe it's worth dwelling on just a little bit so I Tell you what, I'm going to point you over here because I'm over here cleaning my brushes, just about ready to wrap up. And I'm going to stop right there, by the way. I'm going to do some rag lift off, and then I'm going to pack up and head downtown. Anyway, back to my story. So maybe this is fun for you. I don't know. It certainly is my journey. So I was kind of irritated, just like maybe many of you would be. <laughs> Sorry about that. That was not a pretty picture. <laughs> oh, man. And uh, so I kind of, but I didn't get mad, really. I mean, I, you know, I had those feelings like, well, who does she think she is, you know? Well, she was an owner of a successful gallery, so I had the wisdom to not get my back up, as the expression goes, but in fact to say, well, okay then. I'll do something that pops. And I, to this day, I'm, I'm not sure how this, how, how I made this transition, honestly. Um, and by the way, if you want to see, just for fun, if you want to see the kind of stuff, most of the stuff that my friend took to the gallery owner, see what I now call, what I called at the time, and still call my storytelling artwork, which I still love doing. It's, I love doing storytelling artwork. I've just never been able to sell it, so I don't do it a lot. If somebody will say, ooh, do one of those and I'll buy it, just let me know, because I love doing sort of mild fantasy stuff. Anyway, so this woman said, give me something that pops. And so I said, okay, that's what I'm going to do. This did, now, this requires a little bit of explanation. Because how in the world I stumbled on this, again, I'm not exactly sure. But I basically hitched up my britches, <laughs> which I will refrain from doing again, for your sake. <laughs> I hitched up my inner soul and said, okay, I have a lot of skill. I can do this. I'm going to make up a new way of painting. I had a French easel, already had a French planer easel. I bought, I think, a 16 by 20 inch canvas, ridiculously small. I went to downtown Raleigh and I did a painting. Now, I did have a little bit of a hunch because it just so happens that about two or three years before that, I had taught a week long art class for a big church here in Raleigh, you know, one of those mega churches. A lot, I have a lot of friends there. And they said, will you come and do an art class? And the man who is in charge of, you know, administrating such things, and he said, he said to me, and here's what we would like. <laughs> I would never agree to this now, but at the time, I was so ignorant of the world of teaching that I said, sure. He said, here's what we would like. At the end of the class, we would like a painting um, that is done um, collectively by all the students. So I had like 25 students for five evenings and at the end of the, well not, not at the end, after the class, he wanted a painting to go on the wall done by all the students. All right, you with me? This is two years before the art gallery conversation and of course at the time this is like 19 2001 2002 
I kind of slapped my forehead and said, what are you thinking? You can't have students <laughs> do painting, do a painting and have it turn out any good at all, right? So, by the way, I'm almost done here. I'm just going to do a little bit of lifting up and then, then we'll go. But here's what I did. I said, okay, I think I know one thing that can work, that can make this work. Here's what I'm gonna do. I am going to do, and by the way, the, the painting, I can't remember if it was specified or if this is my choice. At the time, I was very much accustomed to doing large paintings, eight by 10 foot paintings. So the, paint, the painting is actually eight by 12 feet. That's how big the painting is that we, the class did for this church. And it was, it was not religious subject matter at all. Uh, symbolic but not you know no crosses or doves or lions or picture of Jesus or anything like that or picture of Judah e Buddha <laughs> Judah picture of Buddha either <laughs> um, so I said I know this is how we can do it I'll do the whole drawing in black and white black acrylic on white canvas then I'm going to mix up a whole bunch of you, you catch it so I knew that they couldn't mess up my black drawing because they had transparent colors. So here's what happened. This was a, this was a epiphany. This was a turning point in my art journey. I knew it would work. I knew transparent on top of black. They couldn't obliterate my black. So they really couldn't mess it up too bad. <laughs> Shh, don't tell them I'm saying this, right? Anyway, so I did that did all the black and white, handed out buckets of transparent color. And when I saw layers of transparent acrylic going on this canvas, layer, dry, another layer, dry, another, my jaw dropped open, my eyes opened up and I said, oh my gosh, that is gorgeous. Changed my life. So fast forward two or three years when I'm having a conversation with the gallery owner, she says, give me something that pops. So frankly, simply, I went back to that experience and said, okay, I saw this one time. So I mixed up, <laughs> let me show you, <laughs> right? It, I didn't have these containers at the time, but that completely explains this. Little pots of pre-mixed acrylic where it's like 20% paint and 80% medium. You with me? So I mixed up like this, grabbed my jewel, you know where that came from, and then did oil on top of it. And I did that, frankly, in a day, one day. I made that transition, I made that discovery, and that's why I've been painting for 15 years, because it's developed a lot, as you can see, but that's basically where that came from. It was an overnight, and I discovered after I started painting in this new, not like an illustrator anymore, that's where I transitioned from the first half of my art journey, where I painted stuff that looked like stuff, to the second half. It happened literally in one day. I don't know how, to, how that can happen, but for me it did. It literally happened in one day, where I went from painting first journey, first half of journey, paint stuff that looked like stuff, to second half of journey where I painted stuff that looked like paint. And once I started painting in the second half, it's like scales fell from my eyes. You know, the sun came out, the, the heavens parted, birds sang, angels whoa, appeared. <laughs> and I began to learn almost everything that I teach day after day after day after day here on my broadcast. The, the, I learned it in kernel form, essentially in one day, in a matter of weeks after that one day. Um, so there you go. Strange journey, I admit. Um, and, and the been a fine artist ever since and uh, I'm not sure how I got on the mic and it's already 320 it's time for me to skedaddle and get downtown I am really liking this painting for any newcomers let me tell you what so what's next will be pencil because I can hardly see any pencil pencil then drawing with dark transparent details and then final edit and then wait a day for everything to dry, then do glazes again and any more darks and light tweaking that I need to do. So happy with the painting and very happy, by the way, 
that it doesn't look at all like this copyrighted image. I'm just assuming this is copyrighted. I didn't take the picture, okay? But we talked yesterday quite a bit about you have to change it significantly so it doesn't look uh, like the photograph. <laughs> that is accomplished. I'm quite liking the... Oh, thank you. Lunch just showed up. Woohoo, what a life. <laughs> yes, my daughter brought that in. <laughs> Woohoo. Life's good. All right. Let me turn around then and talk to you guys. Was that a fun story? <laughs> yes, I'll be going back on. Um, I'll be broadcasting from downtown if all goes well. All right, let me read some of your <laughs> wonderful comments. Woo. Susan, good to have you again, Susan. I took my thin layer of translucent landscape with painting outside of the sun, and, the do it do uh, and boy, does it look different outside. Took it back in and decided I need more layers. Good point, boy. And by the way, you cannot paint in sun. It, I don't. I'm, I mean, I've tried it, and I, I still try it, and oh, it, it's hard. It's hard enough working just outside in the shade. It's so different from, like, working in here. <laughs> Eric, looks like I'm leading an orchestra when I paint. That's fun. Barbara, I think, I don't know if you're getting this. Mostly, I like wet and wet, too. I'd, I'd rather stay here and finish, but I've got other work to do today, so I won't stay here. Go Uncle 60 on that portrait. Oh, oil is so much easier than acrylic. So I hope you hope you have a show us. Share, share it with us, Uncle 60. Share it with me anyway. Eric says, I guess that's why I watch every video you upload. Best teacher on YouTube. Oh, oh there goes my ego. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. You're not true, but I appreciate the encouragement. I really do. Whoops, what just happened? Um, <laughs> oh, boy, thank you. Um, people do a f a prefer, by the way, oil portraits. Oil has that certain shtick that nothing else has. I feel, feel bad for my watercolor friends because there's an amazing watercolor artist, but watercolors just don't get quite the thing in the public's eye that oil does not fair at all gary m you are very welcome <laughs> okay popcorn <laughs> michael i don't think i'd be funny if i weren't painting it's only the fact that i'm not trying too hard to be funny that i'm funny i know <laughs> uh, yeah, Alice, Alicio Peluso, drawing and cardboard modeling. Hello again from Italy. Good to have you here. <laughs> uh, Alicio, laughing all the way from Italy. Oh, sir, sorry, Deborah. You can go back and watch it later. Um, thank you, Eric. I appreciate that very best. And Deborah, thank you very much. That's very kind of you. All right, so I am uh, happy to say that I'm happy with the painting. It's always, by the way, there's a good tip for you. If you can, try to st stop on a painting when you're enjoying it, if you can, because that makes you anxious to come back. Um, this is one of the dangerous moments in every painting is when you stop. You all know that, right? Because if you stop, there's a danger that, that you won't get back to it. So um, try to stop when you're happy happy with the painting if you can if you can and i'm quite happy with this can't wait to get back to it tomorrow tomorrow it's going to be raining cats and dogs at my house as hurricane dorian comes through and um so it'll be a good day to paint indoors uh but now i'm heading downtown and yes i hope you can join me then bye bye <laughs>